Good morning and welcome back. So, um, 18th to 19th century masters, um, do not get perturbed about anything, we will be doing the great satirists. I am aware that we have not done Dryden and Pope, but we are going to handle that also soon. Uh, today I wanted to especially focus on the European masters, particularly who made waves during the 18th and in the 19th century. Um, we will be doing British and American writers in the subsequent classes. As always, please do remember that uh, we are not going strictly speaking in any chronological order. I am taking the more prominent writers from various ages and uh, from various parts of the world, not just the British and American writers. So, I am taking the various writers from the uh, various chronological uh, temporal times as well as from the various spatial times. So, uh, spatial uh, locations. So, uh, even if you find some someone prominent like Pope missed out in today's class or last time's class, um, please do not uh, despair too much on that. We will be, I am aware of that, Pope, Swift, Dryden, etcetera, these are extremely important writers and we are also going to handle the romantic period soon and of course, with the great romantists. So, um, today I am going to do the 18th and 19th century European masters, at least some of them, not if not all, then some of them. Before that, as is our usual practice, let us start with doing the exercises. So, let us look at the first slide here. Read the following. During the 5th century AD, three Germanic tribes came to the British Isles from various parts of Northwest Germany as well as Denmark. These tribes were warlike and pushed out most of the original Celtic speaking inhabitants from England into, into Scotland, Wales and Cornwall. One group migrated to the Brittany coast of France where their descendants still speak the Celtic language of Britain today. Through the years, the Germanic tribes mixed their different Germanic dialects. This group of dialects form what linguists refer to as Dash or Anglo-Saxon. Now, we are talking about the variety of the English language. Remember, English for competitive exams not just focus on literature. But sometimes you may be surprised to find questions pertaining to language and grammar also. What is an indicative? What is subjunctive? What is subj what is uh, 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 let us say uh, uh, a reflexive pronoun? Okay? So, all these kinds of questions uh, do not be surprised if they are asked. Grammar and language and linguistics type. So, the passage refers to, this is your question, please look at the slides here. A middle English period, B old English period, C modern English, C D Renaissance period, which is the correct answer. Second question, please look at the slide here, based on the passage itself, the Germanic tribes refer to A Saxons, Angles, Normans, B Saxons, Vikings, Normans, C, Normans, Saxons, Irish, D, Saxons, Angles and Jews. Next one, identify the writer of the following quotes, okay? just one writer. Some people are always grumbling because roses have thorns. I am thankful that thorns have roses. Same writer and the second quote, the more things change, the more they are the same. Every man has three characters, that which he exhibits, that which he has and that which he thinks he has. Choose the correct response. Jean Baptiste Alphonse Carr, Jean Jacques Rousseau, Montaigne, La Fontaine. Read the following passage. 
Now friendship may be thus defined, a complete accord on all subjects human and divine, joined with mutual goodwill and affection. And with the exception of wisdom, I am inclined to think nothing better than this has been given to man by the immortal gods. There are people who give the palm to riches or to good health or to power and office, many even to sensual pleasures. And this last is the ideal of brood bees and of the others we may say that they are frail and uncertain and depend less on our own prudence than on the caprice of fortune. Then there are those who find the chief good in virtue, well that is a noble doctrine. But the very virtue they talk of is the parent and preserver of friendship and without it friendship cannot possibly exist. Please take a moment, go through the passage. Identify the author A. Cicero B. Horace C. Shakespeare D. Longinus Next question, answer the following Who wrote The Fisherman and His Wife, Rapunzel, Cinderella and Thumbelina? Classic fairy tale and children's stories Fisherman and His Wife is a famous story where a fisherman catches a flounder, a kind of a fish who requests him to let, let it go and uh, uh, because uh, uh, well after all it's a fairy tale and a children's story. So, the flounder speaks like a human being and says he is actually a prince turned into a flounder, so please let him go. And uh, the fisherman returns home and asks and tells this wife, uh, tells his wife about this fantastic incident. Who says that uh, you shouldn't have let him go just like that? Go back to him and ask for a um, for a wish ful fulfillment. And the fisherman goes back, calls out for the flounder, and asks for what his wife has asked the fisherman to wish for, and that is. Uh, a cozy cottage. The fisherman, remember, is very poor and now his wish is granted. He returns home and finds his wife um, in a very comfortable house and uh, uh, the children well dressed, things going on very well. And next he goes back, uh, uh, but the wife is not happy. Next morning she says, no, I think we have not asked for enough. Go back and ask for uh, a bigger house, a, a castle and this wish is granted uh, as well. And after that again the wife is not satisfied. She asks um, for the king's palace and so on. So, this is what happens and then there is a moral at the end. Rapunzel is the girl with the beautiful hair. Cinderella very well known and Thumbelina, uh, a child who is as big as a thumb and what happens to them? There is always a moral, a message implicit in these stories. So, who is the writer of these stories? Charles Perrault, B. The Brothers Grimm, C. Hans Christian Andersen, D. La Fontaine. Next one, read the following. This is the month and this is the happy morn, wherein the son of heaven, eternal king of wedded maid and virgin mother born, our great redemption from above did bring. For so the holy sages once did sing, that he our deadly forfeit should release and with his father work as a perpetual peace. Name the work, same writer, same poet, but which poem is this? are these lines from. Remember, you need to know this poet and his work very well on his blindness. B. Lycidas, C. L'Allegro, D. On the morning of Christ's nativity. Next one, answer the following. Who gave the following advice? Imitate Jesus and Socrates. A. Benjamin Franklin, B. George Washington, C. Thomas Jefferson, D. Alexander Hamilton. Next one. 
read the following as uh, um, Rochefoucauld his maxims drew from nature I believe am true they argue no corrupted mind in him the fault is in mankind this maxim more than all the rest is thought to base for human breasts in all distresses of our friends we first consult our private ends while nature kindly bent to ease us points out some circumstance to please us if this perhaps your patience move let reason and experience prove we all behold with envious eyes are equal rays above our size who would not at a crowded show stand high himself keep others low i love my friend as well as you but why should he obstruct my view then let me have the higher post suppose it but an inch at most if in battle you should find one whom you love of all mankind had some heroic action done a champion killed or trophy won rather than thus be over top would you not wish his laurels cropped dear honest ned is in the gout lies racked with pain and you without how patiently you hear him groan how glad the case is not your own choose the correct response who wrote the given lines a alexander pope b jonathan swift c samuel richards and d samuel johnson next one now see the following extracts are the beginnings of some famous novel this is one typical kind of a question that is often asked beginnings of some famous novels identify a of the first one whether i shall turn out to be the hero of my own life or whether that station will be held by anybody else these pages must show to begin my life with the beginning of my life i record that i was born as i have been informed and believe on a friday at 12 o'clock that at night it was remarked that the clock began to strike and i began to cry simultaneously in consideration of the day and hour of my birth it was declared by the nurse and by some sage women in the neighborhood who had taken a lively interest in me several months before there was any possibility of our becoming personally acquainted first that i was destined to be unlucky in life and secondly that i was privileged to see ghosts and spirits both these gifts inevitably attaching as they believe to all unlucky infants of either gender born toward the small hours on a friday night b Sir Walter Elliot of Callinch Hall in Somerset, Somersetshire was a man who for his own amusement never took up any book but the baronetage there he found occupation for an idle hour and consolation in a distressed one there his faculties were roused into admiration and respect by contemplating the limited remnant of the earliest patents there any unwelcome sensations arising from domestic affairs changed naturally into pity and contempt as he turned over the almost endless creations of the last century and there if every other leaf were powerless he could read his own history with an interest which never failed this was the page at which the favorite volume always opened eliot of callinch hall Walter Elliot born March 1 1760 married July 15 1784 Elizabeth daughter of James Stevenson is square of South Park in the county of Gloucester by which lady who died 1800 he has issue Elizabeth born June 1 1785 and born August 9 1787 a still born son November 5 1789 Mary born November 20, 1791. See, there was no possibility of taking a walk that day. We had been wandering indeed in the leafless shrubbery an hour in the morning, but since dinner, Mrs. Reed, when there was no company, died early. The cold winter wind had brought with it clouds so sombre and a rain so penetrating that further outdoor exercise was now out of the question. 
I was glad of it. I never liked long walks, especially on chilly afternoons. Dreadful to me was the coming home in the raw twilight with nipped fingers and toes and a heart saddened by the shinings of Bessie the nurse and humbled by the consciousness of my physical inferiority to Eliza, John and Georgiana Reed. The, the family of Dashwood had long been settled in Sussex. Their estate was large and their residence was at Norland Park in the centre of their property where for many generations they have lived in so respectable manner as to engage the general good opinion of their surrounding acquaintance. The late owner of this estate was a single man who lived to a very advanced age and who for many years of his life had a constant companion and housekeeper in his sister. But her death, which happened 10 years before his own, produced a great alteration in his home. For to supply her loss, he invited and received into his house the family of his nephew, Mr. Henry Dashwood, the legal inheritor of the Norland estate and the person to whom he intended to bequeath it. In the society of his nephew and niece and their children, the old gentleman's days were comfortably spent. His attachment to them all increased. The constant attention of Mr. and Mrs. Henry Dashwood to his wishes, which proceeded not merely from interest but from goodness of heart, gave him every degree of solid comfort which his age could receive and the cheerfulness of the children added a relish to his existence. Which novel is this? The Dashwood family, the Elliot family, the Reeds, who are these people? And the last novel, the beginning of which I want you to find out. A Saturday afternoon in November was approaching the time of twilight and the vast tract of unenclosed wild known as Agden Heath embrowned itself moment by moment overhead the hollow stretch of whitish cloud shutting out the sky was as a tent which had the whole heath for its floor. The heaven being spread with this palace screen and the earth with the darkest vegetation the meeting line and the horizon was clearly marked. In such contrast, the heat wore the appearance of an installment of night which had taken up its place before its astronomical hour was come. Darkness had to a great extent arrived here on while day stood distinct in the sky. Looking upwards, a first cutter would have been inclined to continue work. Looking down, he would have decided to finish his faggot and go home. The distant rims of the world and of the firmament seem to be a division in time no less than a division in matter. The face of the heath by its mere complexion added half an hour to evening. It could in like manner retard the dawn, sadden noon, anticipate the frowning of storms scarcely generated and intensify the opacity of a moonless midnight to a cause of shaking and dread. Match the passages, five passages, five novels. Match the passages with novels, with the novels. Persuasion, Jenner, Sense and Sensibility, The Return of the Native, David Copperfield. Next one, identify the novel, one novel. Hmm? We can only, we can know only that we know nothing and that is the highest degree of human wisdom. The strongest of warriors are these two, time and patience. Here is my advice to you, do not marry until you can tell yourself that you have done all you could and until you have stopped loving the women you have chosen, until you see her clearly, otherwise you will be cruelly and irremediably mistaken. Marry when you are old and good for nothing, otherwise all that is good and, and lofty in you will be lost. Identify the novel, A. The Gambler, B. War and Peace, C. Uh, the Bronze Horseman, D. Fathers and Sons. And now 11 to 15, you have to identify the theories, literary theories. 
the first one it started out as a way of reading the history of metaphysics in Heidegger and Jacques Derrida, but was soon applied to the interpretation of literary, religious and legal texts as well as philosophical ones and was adopted by several French feminist theorists as a way of making clearer the deep male bias embedded in the European intellectual tradition. Number 12. A branch of modern literary studies concerned with the ways in which literary works are received by readers. It is associated with the aesthetics outlined in 1970 by the German literary historian Hans Robert Haas and drawing on philosophical hermeneutics, Haas argued that literary works are received against an existing horizon of expectations consisting of readers current knowledge and presuppositions about literature and that the meanings of works change as such horizons shift. Unlike most varieties of reader response theory then Dash is more in, interested more in historical changes affecting the reading public than in the solitary reader. Next one. This emphasizes explication or close reading of the work itself. It rejects old historicism's attention to biographical and sociological matters. Instead, the objective determination as to how a piece works can be found through close focus and analysis rather than through extraneous and erudite special knowledge. Next one. This is an approach to literary criticism and literary theory based on the premise that a literary work should be considered a product of the time, place and historical circumstances of its composition rather than as an isolated work of art or text. It has its roots in a reaction to the new criticism of formal analysis of works of literature which was seen by a new generation of professional critics as ignoring the greater social and political consequences of the production of literary texts. It developed in the 1980s primarily through the works of the critic Stephen Greenblatt gaining widespread influence in the 1990s and beyond. Next one. In this approach, the reader replaces the author as the primary subject of inquiry and without a central fixation on the author. It examines other sources for meaning, example readers, cultural norms, other literature etc., which are therefore never authoritative and promise no consistency. A reader's culture and society then share at least an un an equal part in the interpretation of a piece to the cultural and social circumstance of the author. So, these are your choices A reception theory, B new historicism, C new criticism, D post structuralism, E deconstruction. Next one, read the following. I am a sick man, I am a spiteful man, I am an unpleasant man, I think my liver is diseased. However, I do not know beans about my disease and I am not sure what is bothering me. I do not treat it and never have though I respect medicine and doctors. Besides, I am extremely superstitious, let us say sufficiently so to respect medicine. I am educated enough not to be superstitious, but I am. No, I refuse to treat it out of spite. You probably won't, will not understand that. Well, but I understand it. Of course, I cannot explain to you just whom I am annoying in this case by my spite. I am perfectly well aware that I cannot get even with the doctors by not consulting them. The passage is from A. Anna Karenina, B. Notes from the underground, C. The idiot, D. Rodin. And next question, based on the same, I am a sick man passage, this work is an example of a. Surrealism, B. Confucianism, C. Postmodernism, D. Existentialism. Okay, so, uh, let us do the answers. First one is B. Old English period. The question on uh, the period, old uh, English period or Anglo-Saxon period. Okay, so, that is the one. Two is uh, D. The Germanic tribes that are talked about. Uh, D. Saxons, Angs and Jutes. And the, uh, a number of quotes, especially the more things change, 
the more they remain the same is by the French philosopher Jean Baptiste Alphonse Carr. It is not Montaigne, it is not Rousseau, A Jean Baptiste Alphonse Carr. Fourth one on friendship is A Cicero, the Roman orator and writer, thinker and fifth is B the brothers Grimm, uh, the writers of uh, the fisherman and his wife Rapunzel and uh, Cinderella and so many classic children's stories. Sixth is, uh, uh, see all our, uh, poems, all the choices are by Milton, Lycidas, L'Allegro on his blindness, answer is D. So, answer for sixth question D on the morning of Christ's nativity. And seventh, imitate Jesus and Socrates, A, Benjamin Franklin. Eighth is by Jonathan Swift, it is a satire on the death of Dr. Jonathan Swift, Swift writing on his own death. And ninth is, uh, first I was born on Friday night at midnight is David Copperfield, B, Sir Elliot, uh, Sir Charles Elliot is uh, Persuasion by Jane Austen, C is Jane Eyre, Mrs. Reed and her children. D, the Dashwood family, Sense and Sensibility, again by Jane Austen. And E, Agden Heath, Thomas Hardy is the return of the native, one of the greatest writers, novelists ever. D. H. Lawrence, Thomas Hardy, that is another period and category by itself. Tenth, then a host of quotations is B, answer is B, war and peace. The theories, Derrida, it is a dead giveaway, deconstruction, twelfth is the reception theory, thirteen close reading, new criticism and fourteenth is new historicism, fifteenth last one post structuralism. Sixteenth, I am a sick man, a is from Dostoevsky's notes from the underground, answer B, notes from the underground. And which theory? It is existentialist, answer D. Seventeenth, D, existentialism. Please go through these texts thoroughly, they are extremely important and significant from the exam point of view. And as promised earlier, we will be talking, um, discussing at least I will give you an overview of some major European writers. So, the first one is Henrik Ibsen, sorry Ibsen, I B S E N, who lived from, who was a Norwegian 1828 to 1906, one of the greatest playwrights ever, not just from Norway. Of course, in Norway he is an iconic writer, but a writer, a, 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 a dramatist who went on to influence dramatists from across the world. Norwegian dramatist, when he appeared on the scene, drama in Europe, especially in Norway was not a the way we know drama today. His was a drama of ideas. Shaw was influenced by him and so was the great American novel, uh, sorry, playwright Arthur Miller. They all look back to uh, Ibsen, an intellectual leader and one of the most influential figures. He was born in Skeen, a small town in Southern Norway. Uh, at age 16, he became a pharmacist apprentice in the town of Grimstead, where he remained for six years. In his childhood and youth, he displayed traits which appear in many of his chief dramatic characters. He was inf interested in politics, which is reflected in his historical drama Catalan, published in 1850, the theme of which is quite characteristic of many of his later works, which is 
a rebel's fight is glorified only so long as he remains true to himself and to his mission. Catalin grew out of Ibsen's intention of studying medicine. For in a preparation for admission to the university, he had to study Cicero's oration against Catalin and found himself preferring as usual, preferring the rebel to the politician. At the university, he joined it, but soon lost interest in medicine and attended lectures on philosophy and literature. And soon he embarked on a career in the theatre. His 11 years as a stage manager, he was a stage manager um, from 1851 to 57 and also a theatre director and all these uh, jobs provided him with a thorough knowledge of every aspect of the stage and uh, theatre. He acquired his mastery of theatre or stage or theatre theater techniques while working behind the scenes. He was disappointed with the backwardness of his country. He felt his, uh, the atmosphere was not conducive to free creative work. He lived in a state of self-exile, went to Rome in 1864, he left uh, Norway and went to Rome. And uh, his first drama was written in exile, but focused and, and roused his countrymen. This was Brand, B R A N D written in 1867, which was completely Norwegian in character and spirit, just like the succeeding Peer Gint, which was, um, which appeared in 1867, which played in 1867. In the figure of Brand, Ibsen created a preacher whose tra tragedy lies in his uncompromising devotion to an ideal that makes him blind to love and duty. P. Grint is lighter and a, uh, it has a happier tone than Brand and it is considered its counterpart in character, portrayal, atmosphere, symbolism. P. Grint is a spineless and a weak character as uh, the antithesis of Brand's determination. P. Grint was influenced by Ibsen's childhood associations and the rich folklore of Scandinavia, Scandinavia because of its wealth of imagery. Remember the play is very rich in image, imagery. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot uh, read the play or show you quotations, but you should read Pagant. It is a very important and popular play. Uh, it, ha it has become to the Scandinavians as important as Faust is to the Germans and Don Quixote to the Spanish. One of his extremely important influential play is Ghosts, which appeared in 1881. Ibsen stated his purpose as, it seemed to me that the time has come for moving some boundary posts and this is what he said about Ghosts, a time has come to move some boundary posts, push bound the boundaries. Um, uh, the play achieved this uh, idea of pushing the boundaries by extending the boundaries. Uh, of uh, uh, some of the sacred principles of society as theme of the drama. But most importantly, he also came uh, emerged as a hater of the society of his time. This is one constant allegation against Ibsen. He was a hater, angry prophet. He reveals it, he reveals his society as a hollow framework rotten at its foundations, ready to collapse any time. So, there is a woman who mistakenly remained with her husband and the uh, unfortunate consequences of her decision. Ghost is, a, is about a society afraid of itself, for it dreads scandals, dreads uh, simplicity and dreads truth. Ibsen's ghost is a society haunted by the ghosts. What are the who are the ghosts of tradition and custom? Too weak to break away from the past and unable to carry the weight of new ideas. Look at the slide here, and the, here are some of the quotes from his immortal ghosts. It's not only what we have inherited from our father and mother that walks in us. 
is all sorts of dead ideas and lifeless old beliefs and so forth. They have no vitality, but they cling to us all the same and we can't get rid of them. Next quote. I am half inclined to think we are all ghosts. It is not only what we have inherited from our fathers and mothers that exists um, again in us, uh, but all the sorts of old dead ideas. They are actually, now not actually alive in us, but they, uh, they, they are, there they are dormant in, dormant all the same and we can never be rid of them. Whenever I take up a newspaper and read it, I fancy I see ghosts creeping between the lines. There must be ghosts all over the world. They must be as countless as the grains of the sand, it seems to me. And we are so miserably afraid of the light, all of us. I know there is a repetition, but please look at it. Famous quotations, you can perhaps, you know, you never know, but these are important lines that can appear. And after the wild duck, that was his 1884 play, Ibsen returned to the theme of individualism of women in Rosmersham in 1886 and Hedda Gabler 1890. There is not a play by Ibsen that does not contain some symbolic elements. The emphasis on symbolism that is evident in his early verse plays are seen again in his later plays. The use of the wild duck of the white horse in uh, Rosmersham of the sea and the use of the sea in the lady from the sea. His another landmark play is A Doll's House, 1879, in which a woman asserts her independence by finally leaving her husband. And this play stirred up such controversy that Ibsen felt that calling, uh, that he had to uh, uh, write an alternative ending. In The Master Builder, which is 1892 and When We Dead Awaken, which is 1899, Ibsen is uh, concerned with himself and his relation to his art and his place as an artist in society. Arthur Miller's The Man Who Had All the Luck is based on, partially based on the master builder, a man who, is, who looks at himself in relation to his society. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, his, uh, you know, a vehicle of ideas. Here I am giving you, please look at the slide, a doll's house, the first conversation between the man and the woman. Helmer, is that my little lark twittering out there? Nora, yes it is. Helmer, is it my little squirrel bustling about? Yes. When did my squirrel come home? Nora, just now puts the bag of macaroons into her pocket and wipes her mouth. Come in here, towel, and see what I have got, I bought. Helmer, don't disturb me. Bought, did you say, all these things? Has my little spendthrift been wasting money again? Yes, but towel, this year we really can let ourselves go a little. This is the first Christmas that we have not needed to economize. Still, you know, we can't spend money recklessly. Yes, Towel, we may be a, a wee bit more reckless now, mayn't we? Just a tiny wee bit, we are going to have a big salary and earn lots and lots of money. Yes, after the new year, but then it will be a whole quarter before the salary is due. Pooh, we can borrow until then. Nora, the same little featherhead. Suppose now that I borrowed 50 pounds today and you spent it all in the Christmas week and then on New Year's Eve a slate fell on my head and killed me and Nora putting her hands over his mouth, oh don't say such horrid things. Still, suppose that happened, what then? So This is the married life and this is what the play is all. So, this is the uh, beginning of the play, the way he is, tre uh, he treats her, the way she responds to him. So, this is this is something that sets the tone for the play. And uh, here is a, a short video summary that would be of some use to you, those who are interested in a doll's house. Look at the link here. The next important writer that I wanted to talk to, talk about is Leo Tolstoy. The Russian master, 1828 to 
you had Ibsen in Norway, you had Tolstoy in Russia, best known for his epics War and Peace and Anna Karenina, the finest novels ever written. Uh, a novella, The Death of Ivan Illich, which, is, which was published in 1886, is one of the best examples of the genre of novella. Novella is bigger than a short story, I am just giving you a simple definition, but not as big as a novel. So, novella. In War and Peace, which was an 1869 work, he is concerned with campaigns of 1805 leading to Napoleon's victory at the battle of Austerlitz and then Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812. There is a in an interim period of peace, so therefore war and peace. Contrary to what is expected, Napoleon is presented as an ineffective egomaniacal buffoon. Tsar, uh, Tsar Alexander the first is just, uh, you know, he talks a lot, gives a lot of speeches, obsessed with how history will rem remember him. And then you have a patient old man, the Russian general Mikhail. Kutuzov, who understands the limitations of human will, suffering, planning, the three major characters, but then there are lot more that happens in war and peace. I would suggest that you take a good look at the novel, at least the summary of what is it all about. Anna Karenina, another uh, classic published in 1877, the main plot deals with Anna and Ronsky lovers who covertly and then openly defy the established code of marriage. Anna remember is married to someone else. Tragedy follows because neither of the lovers um, is strong enough to sustain or withstand the retaliation of society. War and Peace is also remarkable for the depiction of Levin who is a sort of, whose spiritual leanings reflect Tolstoy's own leanings, so let the character of Levin. I have give, shown you some quotations from War and Peace and here, please look at the slide here, look at the, look at some, a uh, few more quotations because I feel that this is one of those works that has to be done very thoroughly, the quotes from War and Peace. What is the cause of historical events, power? What is power? Power is the sum total of wills transferred to one person. On what condition are the will uh, so for the masses transferred to one person? On condition that the person express the will of the whole people. That is power is power. That is power is a word, the meaning of which we do not understand. Next, good. Why, why does an apple fall when it is ripe? Is it brought down by the force of gravity? Is it because it is stuck with us? Because it is dried by the sun? Because it grows too heavy? Or because the boy standing under the tree wants to eat it? None of these is the cause. Every action of theirs that seems to them an act of their own free will is in the historical sense not free at all, but is bound up with the whole course of history and preordained from all eternity. Next, for a few seconds they looked silently into each other's eyes and the distant and impossible suddenly became near possible and inevitable, war and peace. Next great writer is Dostoevsky, Fyodor Dostoevsky, the right Russian writer who lived between 1821 and 1881, usually regarded as one of the finest novelists ever. Um, steeped in philosophy, existentialism, modernism, various schools of psychology and theology, all these uh, facets or aspects of literary criticism have been profoundly shaped by Dostoevsky. His works are often called prophetic because he so accurately described or predicted how Russia's um, revolutionaries would behave if they came to power. In his time, he was also um, a journalist, one of his biggest successes is Brothers Karamazov. I know you are waiting for crime and punishment also, but let me first talk about Brothers Karamazov, which is like so many of his books, a story of crime. According to some scholars, 
uh, its substance may go back to the death of uh, his own father, Dostoevsky's own father, who was murdered on his estate by a group of serfs. The murder in the brothers Karamazov is however of another order, it is a question of parricide, killing your own father. Central to the work as to all of Dostoevsky's novels are the questions of good and evil and of the necessity of suffering and avowal as the ultimate road to redemption. One of the key episodes is Ivan Karamazov's one of the sons account of the poem he would uh, write called the legend of the grand inquisitor. So, those passages are extremely important. He is a godless Spanish inquisitor, an individual who mistrusts his own fellow men and seeks to keep the truth away from them. Opposed to him is the figure of Christ who trusts the soul of man and is prepared to give man the gift of freedom even if this means suffering and destruction. Crime and Punishment, another important novel, please look at the slide here and look at the quotes from Crime and Punishment. Man is tormented by no greater anxiety than to find someone quickly to whom he can hand over that great gift of freedom with which the ill-fated creature is born. That day must come when men will understand that freedom and daily bread enough to satisfy all are unthinkable and can never be had together as men will never be able to fairly divide the two among themselves. And they will also learn that they can never be free, for they are weak, vicious, miserable non-entities, born wicked and rebellious. Time and punishment happened in 1866, describing a young intellectual called Raskolnikov. He decides to solve all his problems by murdering an old pawnbroker woman. He is driven by utilitarian morality that suggests that killing her is a positive good because her money could be used to help others. On the other hand, Roskolnikov also uh, reasons that belief in good and evil is uh, in itself a prejudice okay? and morally speaking there is no such thing as crime. Nevertheless, um, Raskolnikov, despite his personal denial of morality, sympathizes with the unfortunate. He wants to kill the pawn broker just so because she is an oppressor of the weak and the poor. Dostoevsky's famous theory that justifies, you know, through the mouth of Raskolnikov, is uh, is justifying murder, and uh, uh, it divides the world into people such as uh, you know Solomon and Caesar and Napoleon, uh, I am sorry not Solomon, but Solon, Caesar and Napoleon and ordinary people who simply serve to propagate these species. So, murderers on one hand, ordinary people who just exist, extraordinary people like Napoleon and Caesar uh, etcetera, according to Dostoevsky must have the right to transgress or progress would be impossible, controversial theory. Before I end up, end for today, here is a video linked to crime and punishment, it is a part of the uh, film that was based on the novel. So, thank you very much and we will continue um, with the masters and great events in our next class.